The Space Center is under attack. This is not a drill. The Space Center is under attack. A pair of newly developed communist fighters are approaching the airfield from the west. Hopefully, crack pilot Didi Kerman will be able to hold them off. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. It looks like D.D. Kerman had just enough time to get his aircraft up to altitude. Now he's able to bank right and turn around to face the two hostile aircraft. The Central Kerman Alliance Network has not seen this kind of aircraft before. Hopefully, D.D. Kerman and his expert gunnery skills, along with the advanced K-86 fighter, will be enough to hold them off. D.D. Kerman is outnumbered 2-1 to one out there. However, he is the best, and only, fighter pilot that the Space Center has. All the Kerbals at the Space Center wish him the best. So far, he's done an excellent job of dodging enemy fire. His K-86 is agile enough to swing around and get in some good shots on the enemy. Their aircraft also seem to be very agile. They seem to be quite a match for the Central Kerbin Alliance Network's top fighter plane. It's unclear what exactly happened, but one of the enemy aircraft has bugged out and made an emergency landing just west of the Space Center. It's now down to just one-on-one. -on -one. After avoiding some shots from the enemy, Didi Kerman is able to bank around and start to make his gun pass on the enemy aircraft. Thus far, both pilots have demonstrated tremendous skill. This new communist aircraft is fascinating. I bet the engineers and scientists at the R&D would love to get their hands on one of these things. As far as handling and maneuverability go, this new communist fighter seems very comparable to the Alliance's K-86. It looks like this contest will be decided by skill alone. And Didi again maneuvers to line up with the enemy aircraft. He pulls back and he gets up on the enemy's tail. Didi is doing an excellent job of outmaneuvering this hostile. The communist pilot is able to dive down and maneuver away from Didi. Both pilots are now maneuvering to get into an advantageous position. But so far, Didi has managed to literally stay on top of the situation. It appears that maybe Didi's fighter has a better climb rate than the communist fighter. After a futile burst from the enemy's cannons, Didi is able to spin around and now make a pass at the enemy fighter. His shots also miss, but he is now banking around. Looks like he's got a good gun on the enemy, and I think he clipped him. I think he just got the enemy fighter, and the communist fighter went down. Didi has come out victorious. That is two communist aircraft down for the loss of zero Central Kerbin Alliance Network aircraft. That was some absolutely superb flying by Didi out there. One of the communist aircraft crashed and is completely destroyed, but the other landed intact. Enemy ground forces are now moving in to recover it. Alliance network personnel will need to react quickly if they are to recover that downed aircraft for themselves. While that was some top-notch flying by Didi, the mission isn't over yet. The best way to recover that enemy aircraft and deal with those enemy ground forces is to go out there with an attack helicopter. The engineering Kerbals working at the hangar say they already have everything they need to put together an attack helicopter for this mission. The engineers have already designed a transport helicopter before, and this helicopter will be very similar, as it will also be a coaxial design. This kind of helicopter can be very stable, because both rotors will spin in opposite directions, all the torque will be cancelled out. The first helicopter that these guys designed was just a civilian transport helicopter. This one is going to be used in a more military application. Therefore, things like a more military paint scheme are going to be needed. The rotors are angled forward about 15 degrees to make forward flight a lot easier. Since there are a couple communist vehicles that will need to be dealt with before Jebediah can hop over and fly the communist jet back to the space center, things like rockets and weapons managers will need to be added to this thing and a really cool camouflage paint scheme. The green on the rotor parts is from the mod Textures Unlimited Recolor Depot, but the rest of the helicopter is colored using the mod DCK. The mod DCK is rather old and doesn't include support for the breaking ground parts. Jebediah and Didi make a smooth takeoff. So far the helicopter seems to be handling very well. It seems rather maneuverable and it could be a pretty fast helicopter as well. They have turned around and are now heading out towards the downed enemy aircraft. If you are enjoying the sound of the rotor blades, that is actually from the mod Rocket Sound Enhancement. It also makes the jet engine sound better too. 
Jebediah and Didi have spotted a couple of the enemy vehicles that have come to recover the communist jet. Didi is going to turn to the right here and engage both of them. Shooting with the rockets off of a helicopter is definitely a little different than engaging with an aircraft, but the Kerbals back at the Space Center are confident that Didi will be able to get the job done. Didi now spins left and is attempting to reacquire the targets. He lets off a few rockets. So far he hasn't scored a direct hit. Now he has made a couple hits on it and the one is destroyed. Now he's coming in on the second. He has damaged it, but it is not destroyed enough. It is still a threat. Didi will need to swing around again and finish it off in order for Jebediah to get out and recover the enemy aircraft. Didi swings into position, lights up the rockets, and the enemies are destroyed. Now, Jebediah and Didi are going to fly over to these new communist aircraft. Didi will be able to land right next to it as there's no more threats in the area. This will let Jebediah get out and hopefully fly this plane back to the runway. An advantage to using a helicopter like this is the ability to land exactly where you want to. Jebediah now scurries down the ladder and heads over to this new communist jet. It looks fascinating. Looks like it could be pretty fast. Well, Jebediah will just have to get in and try this thing out. He redeploys the landing gear, gets himself set up, fires up the jet engine. It looks like everything's starting okay. He's going to turn this thing back towards the east and make his way towards the space center. Jebediah now has this plane on full throttle. He notes that the acceleration on this doesn't seem to be quite as good as the K-86. In any potential future engagements, that'll be something for the Alliance Network pilots to note, that they seem to have a better thrust to weight ratio than the Communist. However, the Communist plane is very agile and is able to turn very quickly. The plane does seem to be very maneuverable, at least at lower altitudes. Jeb is reporting that it is a pleasure to fly. Now Jeb is bringing it in safely onto the runway. The Kerbals over at the R&D are going to love to get their hands on this thing and dissect it. Jebediah says he's planning on sending a thank you note to the Communists for the chance to fly this plane. Speaking of the Kerbals over at R&D, they are reporting that they have developed some new technology as far as fuel storage. That will be just what is needed to take Kerbal Kind to the Mun. Very recently, the Alliance Network's Mun rover encountered some kind of communist armed probe on the surface of the Mun. So the Kerbals aren't going to take any chances and they are going to send a full complement of crew to the Mun surface in order to check out whatever the communists have going on over there. The current plan is to send two pilots, Jebediah and Val, and an engineer and scientist, Bill and Bob, to the Mun surface. They will be attempting to land where the last contact with the Mun rover was made. Scientists are packing this lander with all kinds of instruments. Hopefully, they'll get as much data as possible out of this mission. Besides all the scientific instruments that the Kerbals will be taking to the surface of the Mun, they also hope to take some Mun stone back to Kerbin with them. The lander itself has a high enough thrust to weight ratio and enough delta V to land on the Mun, get back into orbit, and return to Kerbin. The upper stage has enough delta V to finish the circularization burn around Kerbin and then take the craft all the way into Mun orbit. The center engine in the booster stack uses a swivel because it is able to gimbal. All the other engines are reliant engines. They are lighter and don't need to gimbal. The boosters use a type of asparagus staging where two boosters will stage away when they are empty, leaving the other two completely filled. Then when they stage away, the center of the booster stack will be completely full of fuel. The fairing on the top of the rocket will generate a lot of drag, but the aerodynamic pressure indicator, the blue icon, doesn't account for drag in this case, so a lot of fins are needed on the bottom of this craft to compensate for the amount of drag on the top of the rocket. And we have lift off of a small step. This is Kerbal Kind's first attempt to set boots on the surface of the Mun. It'd be nice to say that this is purely a scientific endeavor. However, it is known that the communists are up to something on the Mun, and the Alliance Network needs to get to the bottom of it. The booster stage will put this craft almost all the way into orbit, at which point the upper stage engine will take over and finish the circularization burn. And with that, the main engine cuts out, 
and the second engine fires up to finish the burn. Once in orbit, Jebediah and Valentina begin plotting their ejection burn to the Mun. The crew is aiming for an equatorial orbit around the Mun. This should let them land very close to where the communist probe was spotted. Thus far, the mission is proceeding entirely as planned. Jebediah and Valentina light up the Terrier engine for the second time. This will take them out to the Mun. The Terrier engine will need to make three more burns for the crew to land at the desired location. This will be the furthest that Kerbal Kine has ever ventured from their homeworld. And the pilots turn off the engine at just the right time. This puts the craft on the correct trajectory to get into low Mun orbit. At their Mun periapsis, they burn retrograde to put the craft into a stable low orbit. The crew will need to make a small inclination change in order to land and their destination at the Northwest Crater. While in orbit around the Mun, Bob Kerbin conducts a variety of scientific experiments. Mostly that involved him looking out the window and saying the Mun still looks gray. The scanning satellite is no longer overhead over the Northwest Crater. And the Space Center is unable to detect any traces of the rover or the communist probe. What actually happened is the mod physics range extender caused the probe and the rover to spaz out when the lander got close. So this isn't exactly what I intended to happen in the story. So we're just going to have to see where things go from here. The game has caused an unexpected plot twist, and I am just as excited as you are to see where this ends up leading. Valentina is reporting that the ground contact light is on. Space Center, a small step has landed. Jebediah gets out and records the first EVA report on the surface of the Mun. Now Bob Kerman has the very important task of planting a flag on the surface of the Mun. This will ensure that all Kerbal Kind will know forever that the Central Kerbin Alliance Network has been here. With the flag planted, Bob now has the task of finding some Munstone, and it looks like there is some very close to the landing site. Part of the mission parameters are to take some Munstone back with them, because it's going to be really hard to prove they were here by trying to see a flag all the way from the surface of Kerbin, so they're going to take some Munstone back with them. That'll be a lot better proof to say they were here. Plus, the scientists back at the research and development facility are going to be really excited to get their hands on this. It's unclear exactly how bringing some Munstone back will further the Central Kerbin Alliance Network's technology. However, the Kerbals back at the R&D ensure that it really will happen. They've even said something to the effect that it will advance the Alliance by an entire level. With no trace of the probe or the rover, the crew decides to head back to Kerbin. Some of the parts on the craft are not the most tolerant to heat, so the plan is to make two aero braking passes to help the craft slow down enough for a safer re-entry. Another benefit is that this guarantees that the craft will land in friendly territory. This is much preferred to landing in communist territory where they might not be treated quite as nicely. A few unnecessary parts like the lower solar panels and the landing legs for the MUN will probably get destroyed as the craft re-enters the atmosphere. However, all of the critical parts and the crew should remain fine. Bill has reported that it is a little warm inside the craft, but not unbearable. The craft is descending into the lower atmosphere and really beginning to decelerate now. At 10,000 meters, the parachutes deploy. This helps the craft orient correctly for the rest of the descent. At 2,000 meters, the first parachute inflates. Then, as the craft descends down to 1,000 meters, the other two parachutes inflate. This will slow down the craft enough for a soft touchdown. The names Jebediah, Valentina, Bill, and Bob will forever be memorialized in Kerbin history. The first Kerbals to land on the Mun. A momentous achievement for all Kerbal kind done in the backdrop of a cold war. This is Echo 3, and I will see you next time.